Hello everyone, welcome to the Final Word Show. Liverpool beat West Ham by three goals to two and it was genuinely, genuinely glorious. Uh, this show is brought to you in association with the Football Index where you can trade on your football knowledge. Get involved, pick up players, build a portfolio and if those players perform, then you get dividends off the back of it. They've set me a challenge, they've given me a £1,000. The proceeds from that are going to go to a charity of our choice. You can keep up to date with that on the Build Up Show. But yeah, make sure you get involved with the Football Index. Please gamble responsibly. And remember that you've got to be 18 plus to get involved with Football Index. There we go. Gents. Oh. Ah. Hmm. Oh. Glorious. Chris, it's living. Marvellous. It's living. It's living. There was a point which, I don't know, Anfield was a very, very subdued arena for the first goal, probably the first half of the football match to be honest but actually probably until it went to 2-1 yeah. we'll come to that you know the, the, the incident of the game but ultimately that game everyone walked out of Anfield with a spring in the step and that's what happens isn't it you know I mean we've we've got to find our excitement somewhere and I say we I mean the Liverpool side <laughs> um, because we're steamroller in this league right now and we have done since the start of the season and we've had tough times and tough moments during games but it hasn't felt like we've really had any for a while so I don't know I mean like it's just it's the things that you can't doubt about this side are, are the reason that they're so good yeah. it's that never say die attitude it's that they just will not give up in any way shape or form and they've got an unerring belief in themselves and their tactics and and, and that's the reason we're a great side yeah there was it's funny because I, I put out, I said it on the, on a couple of post match shows, Tom, and I put it out on Twitter about how that was very much the result that we all needed. And I, the obvious, I, people in the, in the flesh and people on Twitter saying, "No, I wanted a four nil win." I'm like, "Yeah, and no, we all want five nil wins every week." But in terms of what we needed, particularly coupled with the Atletico results, yeah. where we were disappointed, Liverpool weren't at the best, and you think, well, we've got to G ourselves up, and then you go up against West Ham, and it's Moyes who never wins at Anfield, ever, and you're behind. We actually, in terms of just galvanising the whole process, I just that's why I love that so much. It was, that was what I mean by it. that's exactly what we needed. Yeah, I mean, it, we've had a few of these results this season where we've just battled, like, just gone at a team. I've never seen us actually just keep turning over the team, just keeping that consistency going over and over and over over a period of a long stretch of time. And it was just nice to see, obviously, we had the, the Villa one away, Wolves away, we had Arsenal in the Cup at home, and we had Sheffield away as well. They were the ones I was trying to think of. What, what were the games that were exactly like that, where you've just got to, you're under the cosh and you've, you've got to go and get out there. And the weird thing for me, Paul, is I was not worried and it might have been different in the ground because of the the way it was and, 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 and what have you. But I was sat there and I think I put a tweet out to we were two one down. I literally just went, it's fine. I genuinely believe in this team because I've got I've been at these games. I was a Villa and I was at Wolves, yeah. and I've I've believed and I've g'd up the team. I've done my best to g up this team. That's exactly what Anfield did towards the end of the game, yeah. and it paid off massively yeah. because that's what this team does. Absolutely, and I think, I mean, I went in at half time, Ross thinking, okay, well. We'll, we're always better than second half, so this this will be fine. When it went to two one, I was a bit like, huh, okay. But I I agree with Tom. I, I, look, it's not that I didn't consider that we could, you know, we, we we could lose or we could drop points or whatever. But I also wasn't nervous about it because there's just a great assuredness about the way this team plays. It never rushes. You're not you've not got lads legging it all over. But it's bizarre because like we time waste when we're drawing and losing games. You, you know what I mean? Like we we don't we don't leg it. We take our time over throw-ins. We'll make sure the right person to take the throw-in takes the throw, and everyone's where they need to be. And they just press on and do what they do. Yeah, I think it's just a bizarre feeling to a you can see two goals at Anfield for the first time probably since Everton. I think and then to be behind in the second half. So like you're not sure how to react. But I was the same as Thomas going. This will be sound. I think they got the confidence in themselves to to pull a result out of the bag, but the, the patience as well. Like you know, I think that's where the confusion comes in. When people say, "Oh, I want a four 0 win," like you can't have that every week. West Ham causes problems, and they're going to. But I think you know the half time thing. I thought that as well, thinking, well, we'll get him at half time. It'll bollock him as well, as well as the tactical changes with the, you know, the analysis that they do. But sometimes you just need to kick up the arse from Klopp. It might be as simple as that. The, um, and it, it didn't work until we went two one down. <laughs> yeah. The kick up the arse from Klopp came with the ox substitution. Yeah. That's yeah. when it all happened. That's when it all changed. And there was a, an assertiveness about that substitution. And it was like Klopp just going, no way, no chance, no how. I am making this change now. It was fifty three minutes. We just conceded, and he wasn't wasting time. He was pulling them back as the goal was going in and be, and did you see what happened before that with Naby Keita anybody 
he's flipping about uh, and Abby Keita and he does it like three times about his positioning, not about what he's doing with the ball and stuff. He's telling Keita to go forwards and he's telling him again and he's telling him again and we can see then he just hooks him. Wow. And he's like, wow, right, this is a big fucking change. This is what's going to happen. And you saw the space that opened up for Ox. Like, it's horses for courses sometimes with footballers. I'm not saying Keita's a bad player because I don't think he had a great game. Mm -hmm. and I'm not saying Ox is a better player than Keita, but in that game at that moment, Ox is exactly what we need. Klopp recognised that. Didn't dilly dally, put him in there, and we go on and win because of that. It's um, it was a weird, it was an odd performance from Naby Keita, wasn't it? I um, it was fine at times. We come out talking about it in the, on the instant matches. Like I was like, I didn't think he had a very good game, but you 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 I mean you said I thought he was all right, you know. But I think I'm expecting so much from him, and we've we, we went, normally when he plays, he's just dead good. You know, he's either assisting or he's scoring. He was a bit kind of flitting in and out. He, he, I saw him do a lot of the box-to-box -box stuff, but you're right, I think we needed him. We didn't need him to be box-to-box. -box. We needed him to be putting the pressure on. We needed him further up the pitch. And in the second half, and he didn't get long in the second half, but he, he was he was actually sweeping up a bit, almost too much. And you're right, when Ox comes on, it, it, it changes the thing. Um, and, and just just on Kaiser, uh, just a little bit, and maybe you want to talk about him a little bit later and stuff. No, no, let's go. I, I come out the game, right, and I was like, he did some really good stuff and he did some really shit stuff. So I looked at the stats this morning. I've not had time to watch the full game back yet, and I will do. And it, I, he lost the ball three times. That was it. Mm. And I said to you this morning, we were sat around the table having a couple of that, and I was like, I must remember every one of those times. Yeah. And that's why I've come out the game being a little bit probably more down on Naby than, than, he, than he deserves. Like, his passing was on point. I think he completed 37 of 39. In comparison, Trent loses the ball 22 times. Yeah. Kaita loses it three. Yeah. You know, and when you put it like that and Robbo's over, I think Robbo's about 22 and Firmino's up there with about 14 or something like that. And then you're like, I must literally just remember all three of the times, but he tries these hard passes. Yeah. He doesn't try the easy ball. And sometimes you might look at, like, I'll use Jordan Anderson as an example, where he gets the ball on the edge area and instead of trying to play a ball into striker's feet, he'll play the ball right. And in my head, I recognise that that's good with keeping the ball. But now he wants something more quickly. That, it's a type of, like, aggressive footballer that he is. That first half, because I thought we were poor, like, by and large, in the first half, but it was like, it was like an impressionist painting of what you're meant to do. As opposed to being like a photo or you know photo realistic, it was like the, the, the it was the general shape of how you meant to play, but everything was just blurred. It was like you know the pa the passing was all half a foot off, or the touches were just slightly off or whatever. The overall system and how we were doing it was generally okay. But Naby Keita was probably a decent example of that. He just didn't. It wasn't laser focused. It wasn't just. It wasn't tangibly brilliant. He was just. Well, uh, I All think right. the main thing for me was the amount of space that we let them have in the midfield. Usually teams don't get that and they, would, they were able to pick through us quite a bit and I thought that was really strange and, and like you don't get that in a Jordan Henderson midfield because he's just, he's everywhere and you notice it, you notice the high press right there. Jordan Henderson's injured and Abby Keita's got to come in and, 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 and try and replicate that. Um, he was involved in the first goal. He, he starts oh, jinking through and, he, and that's what he's fantastic at and that's where he's different to Ox. And I think... Look, Ox comes on and you know for a fact he's going to pick the ball up and have a shot. That's the first thing he wanted to do. He had, to test did, it. It? he had to test it and then everyone's like, oh, so people are backing off or going to him and it's open up space and blah, blah, blah. Because Naby Keita loves that little incisive stuff, doesn't he, where he's playing little one-twos and he's fantastic at it. But I just think they just crowded everywhere and it just wasn't the right thing. And, yeah. and it was a great substitution, the perfect man to bring on because... Then people just started taking shots. You saw Trent taking shots. You saw Robbo taking shots. You're thinking, okay, this is better. Whereas I don't think Naby Keita having a shot from distance is not that. Look, I'm sure he can do it, but it's not as dangerous. And and, and yeah, you're right in the horses for courses thing. It, it's just nice though that we have these different options because one game Ox might play and everyone's like, they've got the situ they've got the situational situational awareness to kind of block that. You go, all right, play through the middle with Naby Keita. They're giving up the space. Well, I was funny. I was talking to my brother-in-law Ross, and he, he said this thing about Liverpool don't really have their like a, a, a target man or someone to change the game or whatever. And I used the old analogy of you don't need a plan B, you just need to make your plan A better. And it, what we've got, and that's what Tom's saying there, is spot on. Is that like the horses for courses approach? Is that we're still playing largely the same system, but you drop guys and it's just got different attributes. And it does it. If it completely changes how you play the game by the guy, by the personnel that you're dropping into the system, and that's the difference. Ox is just so much more direct. 
He just runs. He runs in straight lines and looks to pick. You know, looks to play he'll wide with his or first looks to have a touch shot. And he'll get his body across you. Yeah. And that's not what Naby. Naby will slow it down and jink around you. You know, they're, they're yeah. just two different approaches. I think Naby prefers having people close to him so he can do a couple of step overs and glide past him. When he yeah. just got caught out yesterday, I think you're right in the midfield congestion. It was just like it just wasn't working for him. I think yeah. sometimes he think make plan A better. Sometimes he might need to make his plan A better. Yeah. If it's not working, then just maybe try something slightly different. Yeah, I enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed uh, Gary Neville putting the video out yeah. saying that Liverpool were bottling it. I, oh, I, I, he's never learned, will he? He's just a dip. It's a fair play to him though. He kept it up, didn't he? Yeah. And then the seconds later, when Liverpool scored, um, Gary retweeted it, and I've used it last night and this morning. It's a fair play. Yeah. But like, he's he's quite good. He did loads of pieces on Liverpool before and and afterwards as well, actually. I mean, you know, he's really complimentary about Liverpool, so like, I hated him as a player. I quite like him as a pundit. It's it's funny thinking how many people will have been celebrating that, like just like, oh, it's two one West Ham. I get to give Liverpool shit again, and we've just gone through. How many times last season we turned City games on because it wasn't <laughs> quite going their way, yeah, yeah. only to watch City win and be to be away to the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> you know, um, and so yeah, I, I like that. I mean, look again. I mean, I, I've seen. Tweet going like West Ham are going to beat Manchester, uh, beat, beat Liverpool today by Manx, and then the second tweet is, yeah, classic fucking thing for getting new followers or engagements, and you're like, nah, lads, you fucked up, you were wrong, you shouted your mouth off. Now everyone's retweeting you and laughing at you because you're the tit. I tweeted David Moyes as a football genius when we went four two up because like, oh, this is safe, and it was like, oh shit, it's been ruled offside. <laughs> <laughs> delete, 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 delete. That, yeah. that offside one's really interesting because it harks back to what Tom was saying before, doesn't it? Ox comes on, takes that shot from distance. That, you know, a few minutes later, whatever, 20 minutes later or something, two people are closing him down and it frees up the space for Trent. Yeah. And that's what that sighter does. And it's not always about what the what, what you're doing in the moment, but you can quite often set things up for later on in the yeah. game. Can we talk about the football genius um, of David Moyes? As much as we we can praise Klopp's speed, speed of thought and aggression in making the substitution, David Moyes completely handed us that football game by basically letting Trent Alexander-Arnold have the, the rest of the game off by taking Felipe Anderson off. Like I watched, it was like three times in the space of about five minutes where Trent was pushing up high up the pitch and Anderson picked it up just in the, pretty much in the left back, left wing back slot and just dropped the shoulder and walked past Trent. And then all of a sudden he took him off. I, we scored three minutes after he makes the, after he makes the substitution. It. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> what the fuck is he doing there? I mean, I'd be, I'd be fascinated to see... Just in terms I, of I've how... heard pe- like people I know sit behind the um, the dugouts over there still, and they they said they could smell burnt toast, and it must have been what Moyes was doing. <laughs> yeah, he must have yeah. had a fucking soak or something. He's just had a, like, he's he's had not a come up with there. a fucking good thing. There. He's had a senior moment, hasn't he? <laughs> because it's it's I, I'd, I'd be interested to know what like the average positions were of, in terms of where West Ham of you because they move. Ha- they bring Haller on centre forward, which I get because he's the big money centre forward sign. He's the guy who's most likely to get them a goal. And I understand they've had to jig things around with, because of injuries and all that kind of stuff. Like, but it, all of their joy and all the problems they caused us, our fullbacks had a torrid time in that yeah. first half. Andy Robertson had a really tough Snodgrass time. Snodgrass was giving him he was Snodgrass and nightmares. Antonio were Antonio. giving him all kinds, like just stretching and making making him come back. It was lots of like how many corners they won just by. It was having to put a block tackle in right at the dead ball. And the it, dead it wasn't like a lump ball over the top. That's the thing. They built mm. through the middle. Yeah. They built through the midfield. And it was like, I was watching, I was like, these are playing really well. I was surprised because me and Ross went down to, 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 to their ground and they were dire. Yeah. Like, they gave us a few problems, but not really, really massive. And you're just thinking, oh, well, what's going on here? So to then try and like, they're not trying to play through the middle using Anderson and what have you. It was it was just so strange. When you just it. put you took like as as much as Hal is probably a, a good a good footballer or whatever, he might might be a decent Premier League centre forward. You're putting him into Virgil van Dijk's fucking zone. And even Joe Gomez, who both had brilliant games. Yeah. And again, we were we were struggling. You know, we it, it took a lot of bravery for Trent and and, and, and Robert to Go, you know, to, to really commit, but they were causing both of those lads problems, and it was just like they gone. And it, once they switched it, it was like, oh. and all of a sudden, Trent is just uncontested in the final forty yards of the pitch, time and time again. David Moyes is at a time insane. in the game, at a time in the game where that's when you look to take advantage of us. You, you know, you're two one up. You know we're going to be pushing our fullbacks even higher than we normally do, and. 
I, I didn't get it. I, I, you know, normally I think Antonio plays really well against us, mm -hmm. and always I seem to remember him always giving us trouble. But Joe Gomez physically had him off, yeah. mm -hmm. and I, and I was really surprised about that. That was the one thing that I came out the game going. I've not seen like Antonio gives us problems, and he he was never over near Van Dijk because he knows better than that Antonio. But Gomez was pushing him off the ball like, and he was falling over. And you're like fucking hell, Joe's strong here, and he dealt with him. So yeah, he moved him out to the left wing. He doesn't cause anywhere near as many problems as Felipe Anderson, but he does have that one amazing through ball. I think it was him uh, to the young lad, Bones. Bowen. Yeah, that's a brilliant through ball. Like. Yeah. Absolutely. That was the only thing I seem to remember him doing there. Like, but Let, terrible substitutions. And thank you, David. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's, uh, Anderson was coming back from an injury, though, wasn't he? So maybe that's why he took him off. Maybe. But also, I said this after the game last night as well. If Liverpool are the fittest team in the league for me, yeah, yeah. so maybe they don't, they're just completely goose. And you think, well, we'll win in, get some fresh legs on. But and he, it didn't work out. Well, for took him. A wide, but they took a wide man off and put a centre forward. Yeah, on this him. isn't yeah. like the, 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 the forwards aren't going to be that tired. He's not, he, most of the sense of all just stayed still. Mm. He was, in fact, he, was, he wasn't even running. He was in fucking Gomez's his pocket, getting carried around after fucking game. The best, the best not even one. Used his legs. The best one for me is Gomez is like just backtracking, 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 stand tackle, and just takes the ball away. And I was like, Joe, Joe, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I, 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 but he did it over and over again. There was one where he brought the ball down and then just turned his man and walked away with it. And I was like, this is like you see Joe Matip come on at the end and look, Joe Matip's great. But he just fouls him on the edge of the box. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're yeah, like, like, Joel, what are you doing, that mate? That was a like the, one of the most insane substitute appearances I've seen since that game where James Milner came on and gave the ball away, like you know, like about three times. It was mad. It was like he was a competition winner. It was like he'd never played football before. It was like me joining that Legends game. Before. <laughs> That's what it was like. It was Joe, Joe Matter turned into what we all kind of think thought he was at his worst put versus like that. Waving arm, inflatable, inflatable just tube like man. like a giraffe on the football field. Just barmy. It must be so hard. Imagine coming into that game and you're like, shut it up, lad. I haven't played for ages, <laughs> boss. <laughs> like, what do you want me to do? Yeah. I've got no rhythm We're going to put all. the centre-half, who's brilliant, who's had a, a, probably one of my man-of-the-match performances from Gomez. We're going to shift him to right-back <laughs> yeah. and we're going to put centre midfield. What's that about? It worked. It was crazy. It worked. It, like, well, it did work. But it, like, worked. Uh, it worked, thank just in a, in a roundabout, in a roundabout fashion. <laughs> um, right, let's go back to the actual elements of the game then. The first goal, um, wonderful, wonderful dugout cross, cross from Trent. Uh, two assists on the night. That's 13 assists this season. 12 in the Prem, which is exactly the same as he got in the whole of last year. He's two behind his total of 15. Um, he's Ross, done liberty. He was Tom, fucking it? sensational last yeah. night. When, wasn't when it? will people learn? <laughs> like, he, and I said again to when we played Madrid in, in a week, like they gave him loads of space on Robbo because I think they were fine. As we said, it's on the build of just cross it in, we'll deal with it. But there's a massive quality difference, which we also said between West Ham uh, and Madrid. But you just can't give him that time. I, he got interviewed afterwards, and he got asked, like, do you just put it in like a hit and hope, or do you pick a space? Do you pick out a man? He said a bit of both. So, like, he practices it on a daily basis and. But yeah, the stats speak for himself. Why do you not look at that and go, we need to cut that out? And equally for Robert, I know it's hard because it's picky poison. You're giving time to Cater and you and shouldn't Genie be box, able to put that cross. You shouldn't be able to score from that position. No. I think everyone kind of takes a bit of a breather because it is. It's in a. It's not in a dangerous position of the field. Trent's basically running away from goal. You know, and the way he has to. He has coming to out. Dig, well, exactly. Yeah. He has to he, dig it out. But he, but he slows down mm. as well. That was the thing that really caught my eye on watchback is. He's six yards away and he's slowing his run down because he knows he's going to make it and he, he, he can't get there too quickly. It, it was like, if you watch it back, it, that for me was like, everything else is unbelievable, but slowing down, like there's a natural reaction like the to get there as fast yeah. as possible <laughs> because you think it's going out of play. Yeah. He knows it's not. Mm. He knows he can get Mo there. Mo Salah did that as well, didn't he? he mm. Oh yeah, my he definitely God. slowed down. I have never been more angry. Oh, oh, this is the most angry I've I been in a Liverpool player. Oh, the ball. Is it when we throw throwing? The moment yeah. where uh, the ball inexorably crawls at a play and Mo Salah goes, gives it up, goes, gives it up, and then goes and you realise he could have cut if he just walked, if he just yeah. carried on walking, he'd have, oh my God, I was like, because it was right in front of me. I was, it was indicative oh. of, his, of his entire performance, really, wasn't it? <laughs> just, just what stop, he, go, stop, go. What is he doing? That, that, that trend cross is, is fantastic, but Declan Rice did it later on as well yeah, for their yeah. goal. Yeah. And that it, it's basically one of them where you know you've got no time, because Trent knows he's got no time really either. Yeah. Put it into a proper dangerous area. Both of them were great goals. Like Jeannie Van Alden's header, 
is unbelievable and yeah. obviously it should get saved Fabianski had a terrible terrible game but like to get that on target with enough power to beat beat Fabianski fantastic I can understand switching off when it's Declan Rice in that position but like never switch off when Trent's got the ball on, on the wing anywhere at all it's funny how things happen in, in, in footy in it how you, you're influenced by what you see around you I don't, I don't know that Declan Rice tries that cross if Trent hasn't done it in the in, in the first half because it's basically like, oh, it's all I know it's for, Ten to, yards to, deeper, to be but fair, I've probably seen them three or four times this season, and he does. He, he's, a, he, he's, I think he's their best player to be honest. Oh, he is the best. Right? He is the best player. And uh, I thought he was good again last night. Uh, I think he does try that. I think I've seen him do that a few times, but the delivery was unbelievable. That number eighteen who came on at half time, he was he was one of the reasons that they gave us so many problems. Second half, he was just. He was just everywhere. Fabinho wasn't. Yeah. Like, he, and not he didn't always receive the ball, but he was causing us massive headaches and moving Fabinho around. And I think he really struggled with him, whoever yeah. he was. Four, four, four nails. That, 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 uh, as long as he was eighteen. Four nails. Yeah. That goal was really good though from Declan Rice because he comes from deep and I think he runs through the middle and runs out to the side, drags Gino and Aldam out the way, and then where that, that man then should have been managed, but there was a bit of miscommunication, opens up that space in the centre, and then Funnels is just in there, and great finish, but I was watching, I was like, that's great footballer, and it, it, it is lax defending from us, but Gini's just like, I've got to follow that man, that yeah. is my man, I've got to follow that space, Mane should be coming in, but Mane doesn't know, he can't see behind him, but it, it, that's what you've got to be to, to score against Liverpool, you've got to have them little flashes, and that really Really good movement and West Ham just West Ham really gave it a good goal to be yeah. fair to this. I thought um, I thought Aaron Cresswell was brilliant as well. Again, yeah. first half is another one that he gave, he pinned Trent back the amount of times he was one on one with him and he got and he got past them. Um, it, it's just interesting because I've all, I've off you know he's a scouser isn't he? And I've always got one eye on the other scousers floating around the Premier League. Connor Cody being the other one, the other obvious one. Um, Nolan as well. Kev Nolan, I, I, I had no idea Kev Nolan was on the was on the coach. I stuff, only like. knew because Antonio kept marking Allison on every corner. And we were like <laughs> fucking fighting, and I was like, Kev Nolan's got to be on this fucking coach. It's one, it's it's one trick. <laughs> what can you bring to the table? Well, David, <laughs> I, I, I remember Sam Allardyce making me do this one, and also you can do like this as a celebration. <laughs> nailed it, nailed it. What ne what next, coach? Fancy coming for a bevy? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Edward Creswell was brilliant, and it, it, I've I've just had an eye on him for a while. I, look, we don't need him because of Andy Robertson, of course. Like, but player, but I do. That was a great audition, and it made me think that if you were ever going to, there's probably tons of people who'd be like, oh, because I, I got the similar response when I mentioned Connor Cody. We have a real elitism, as though as though everyone knew Andy Robertson was a player. When we sat, we signed him. Something about something about a player like him, I, I, we could do far worse than having Aaron Creswell in the uh, in the squad because he was that good. Um, let's see, Mo Salah. No, oh, let's see. Yeah, Mo Salah. Let's go with Mo Salah. Why not? Um, <laughs> he's been in weird form, but he's now got six goals in his last eight Premier League games. <laughs> Great finish as well. Yeah. Right through his legs. <laughs> Fabianski, <laughs> honestly, I've been saying this for ages, and I lo like he's garnered a load of like bizarre kudos. Fabianski's crap, and like he's not because he's a Premier League goalkeeper. Is he really good? He's not though. He's he is. He's, 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 right, he is like. he's in that bracket of goal. He's Mignolet, and that's all. You know what I mean? He's worse than Mignolet. I don't think he is. I yeah, think he's, better, he's just Simon Mignolet. He's just good at. He can't. He's got no distribution. He's a good shot stopper. He's fine. He's got that experience of him being, a, 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 you know, being an Arsenal, so that he can say, "I was at Arsenal." And people go, "Ooh, Arsenal!" That's a, tell me some Arsenal stories. Uh, what's Arsene Wenger like? And then, and then they realise all three goals good. are his fault. All three goals are his fault for me. He's he's just he's better. He's miles better than that. Like awful Eastenders bouncer that they had in goal for for, for like two months. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was terrible. Roberto. I remember he's watching not goal keeper. Keeper him. I thought you were talking about Adrian for a bit there. I was like, what's no, the no, fucking no, Slyland? No. Uh, no, Roberto is yeah. one of the he's he's defo like blank that he's a goalkeeper. Yeah, he, so like, he doesn't like using his hands. No, he he, um, he actively jumps out the way of the ball. Yeah. It was a great game to watch. Fabianski is a shit Hugo Lloris is what he is. He's that type of goalkeeper. <laughs> no, but like he's enough. But he's nothing. He, he, yeah. he, he made some really good saves in that game. But he's a goalkeeper. I keep saying this. He's a good shot stopper. You're a fucking goalkeeper. If you're not a good shot stopper, give it up. Yeah. Honestly, because what else are you bring into the bring into the table? Um, no, he, he he's a 
he, he tries to do the Gordon Banks palm up for Genie's header like an idiot. He then lets one through his legs. He, and yeah. then he's got no pace to get there. I mean, there was one where uh, Allison's running towards and Van Dyke's like, it's yours, it's yours. And the, the West Ham player gets a touch to it. And I was like, <gasps> and then it's just like, no, Allison's just got it. And there was another one where Gomez fucks up and Allison's oh, on his toes. It's Antonio running through yeah. and Gomez slips. Yeah. And he runs through, and yeah, and just That's the Allison business. just comes and deals That's with it. That's the absolute. I don't know if, whether this is one of the ones that you're talking about. The, the ball first half was going into our box, and it's the one where Allison just picks it up like that, yeah. but it's dead close. I don't yeah. know if that's one of the ones you're talking about. He did about. too, he did one in, that in but, both halves. Yeah. Like, it was like Allison was the only person in the ground who knew he could use his hands. Because <laughs> the entire <laughs> cop was thinking, like, fucking slide and just time, and everyone was like, and he oh. just goes. Right. And everyone's yes. like, oh shit, he's a goalkeeper. Yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah, 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 duh. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, I am. I did dig out Fabianski before then, but to be fair to Salah, the movement, to get into that space, and it's a great run from... Um, Whoever it is that goes towards yeah, the back there. I can't remember. But it's fantastic. And but Robbo <laughs> to get down that wing, put that ball in, you'd expect Mo to just put it in the corner, yeah. but at least it gets on time. It's target. mad because it comes from a moment. Uh, we, we had, like... 10 minutes of just ridiculous pressure. I was saying to you before, Tom, there was, a, there was a spell of like a minute and a half where we had like three corners and it, it, the crowd were up. Yeah. Everyone was whistling and jeering and booing. It became a cauldron for like that, for that 10 minutes. And they're the things that happen when you're on, you're on, you're on, you feel like you've got to be on your best and you, you're very, you're very aware of everything you, you, you need to be your best. And sometimes they're the moments when you're overthinking it, you're too busy thinking about, I'm going to have to be, I'm going to have to be in my corners here. And then all of a sudden the ball's just, yeah, through you. Absolutely fucking glorious. Um, and then Joe Gomez sort of scuffs one, it comes off a defender. We react again, Ross, Trent, is the most aware. This is the one that's the perfect example of what we're talking about and Moyes' substitutions and where they completely capitulate. Trent Alexander Arnold is just basically completely unmarked on the right wing. He has it twice. He has it in the disallowed goal as well. Um, but it's it's the awareness because we can talk about all the things this side's good at and it's it's great at, it's great at fighting. It's got a great understanding of the system and all this kind of stuff. But it's great at just being alert to things happening in and around the box. Dibba Carrigi in the derby last season is a similar sort of kind of situation to it. Just just absolutely brilliant. And it was, even if we'd not scored that, I felt like we'd go and get another one anyway. Yeah, it's the confidence they grew into the game. I think I think when we went 2-1 behind was when we actually started playing football and took control of the game. But I think before that, it was just a bit, kind of a bit like... But even wasn't it was a bit it was a bit shit. But I think once they knew the crowd was behind them, which I think goes hand in hand because there was loads of stuff on Twitter. I've gone oh shit, the crowd was at half time for the first half. Mm -hmm. I think and sometimes yeah, sometimes I don't I think I, I mean where were you Saka? Sorry, Ross. up a um, up a Ken. Up a, yeah, of course. So do you, like I, there was no there were no coherent songs really sang in the first half. Well, I could really hear was the West Ham fans yeah, singing. Like, absolutely, and I heard a few bits and pieces of like. We, we scored, we said we're going to win the league, and then when they scored, they said we're going to win the league, which is brilliant, by the way. Well, they did uh, like three or four of them self deprecating chants, which, yeah. to be honest, like, left I, us flat. Like, I, uh... I actually think they're really funny once, but then I think the poor lads on the pitch, exactly. lad, you, you yeah. like, you're singing about how shit your players are. Yeah. Like, one's funny, four's no help. Yeah. Well, they, you know they sang mean? one about we scored a goal. Yeah. yeah, like like we scored a goal. Like, I don't know what the tune is. Probably like we scored a goal. It we is, scored yeah. a goal. We How scored shit a must goal. you be when we're not away? Yeah, you know what I mean. And, and yeah, you're right. That doesn't do your team much. much the lads just looking around and going, "We're playing really Fuck well." Fuck you! Yeah. <laughs> Fuck you! I'm gonna lose this game now. <laughs> yeah. Just for you. In your faces. Um, yeah, but like you, it was, it was, and that's why again it goes back to my point at the top about the, the win that we needed, like. I've said this for, for ages. I remember, like, like the, it was like the coach greeting thing. When we see how big, how big we can do it, it makes you think, why don't you do it for every game? And then this thing, well, you know, you want it to be special, but there is something about raising your overall level. And that first fifty-five minutes, fifty-four minutes, or whatever of that game was the way it was everything that we that, that's been terrible about Anfield for the last twenty years. There's a lot of expectation. You go in, no one's bang up for it. No one's getting into it. And we that that the whistling and the jeering of every opponent's touch. Why we can do that oh, yeah. for every game? But, 
because it, it, it makes us something else. But I think you're right, there's expectancy and possibly complacency from people yeah, absolutely. that go, I'm not criticising everyone in that sense, but like they need something to feed off as well. So it's a novelty to go 1-0 behind at Anfield, and then we just go, oh, what's this? What, what, what do we do now? We're normally two, three goals up, and I think once we go 2-1 down, that's when everyone went, actually, I, with the substitution with Ox as well, I'm actually, let's get a fucking grip of this. Yeah. And I, I think that combined... They scored, through. and we went, and we immediately started Chatting, you know, just chanting off, chanting off the back of it, and as you but say, the, the second they then got the, the ball, it was just, it was venomous mm. because everywhere can join in with that, yeah, as exactly. well. That you know, the booing and the whistling and the cheering, everyone can join in with it. I actually, I don't think it's sustainable for for our crowd, to be honest with you. I think there's there's probably a percentage of people that that's sustainable for. But generally speaking, I just I just don't think it's sustainable, and, I, and, I, and I'm not even sure it should be. Yeah. To be honest, I get that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not disagreeing with it. I'd love it to be like that personally every single game, but also there's a rawness and a realness to what happened last night, yeah. which I think you lose the impact if it's all the time. The thing is, though, it's all the time. It's not all the time for the players you're playing against. I get what you, I get your point. I think, and the, and the, the thing is, you can't do it often. Because how often do teams actually have the ball at Anfield? It's why, you, like, I remember going back to 13-14, we did it to City and ruined them. And then Chelsea came and gave us the ball. And you can't boo because you've got your own, your own players who've got the ball. You sing. You know, and what, what, what we do with the best of it is you boo when they've got the ball. And then after a while, you get bored of booing and you just sing a song for a yeah. bit. But everyone's used to making noise. I, I see no reason why we can't fucking make everyone feel dead uncomfortable because ultimately, you're only talking probably collectively on of their, their team, teams being on the ball. It's, it's like a handful yeah. of minutes, isn't it? More than more, more than anything else. But it makes, it's just yeah. It, I, I, I don't know. Like, you know, I, I'm not I'm not trying to disagree here. In a, like, I'm not trying to. I'm just telling you what I feel like. And you know, when you get those ten minute Bobby Firmino chants that are just out of this world and are so much better than the platitudes that are sometimes given at the start of a game, mm. just because it's the start of the yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. There is a big difference between that. And I, I, I just feel like if that was all the time, you lose something. Mm. It's not quite the same. Natural, all the way isn't through. it? When that happens, yeah, yeah. And, and I can't put my finger on what I think it is. Yeah. But I, I've been to games where we've sang all game, yeah. but they've not felt like Barcelona oh, yeah, or yeah, fucking yeah. Dortmund because I, there's something in the air that I can't explain. But this happens. is what I'm talking about, raising your overall level, is that at the minute, like... We should net it, 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 complacency is the word, and it, and it's it comes it's it, it's a it's a it's a creeping thing, but that's what that's what I, I looked at it and was like this is what the rest of the season is going to be like. There's going to be no atmosphere at Anfield between now and the end of the season because there's an expectation we're just going to fucking win every game and it's going to be done. And when we went one nil up, I was a bit like we celebrated and then it was just shit. And I was like, this is just shit, and we we shouldn't be getting and you, you, you can't have it perfect, but. We shouldn't have a situation anymore where we can hear the opposition fans because we should be in, we should be creating something because because we're about to win the fucking league and that's why me saying it's not going to make any fucking difference at all. But the point is, you, you, we're always going to raise our game for Barcelona and we're also going to raise our game for big European nights and Man City and the big rivals. But the issue is always about how do you just. Rise the tide on the on, on everything else in between instead of it having to still be these fucking massive peaks and drops. Like we need to go a goal down for it to be. I think to be a thing. I think it was a it was a perfect storm. I, I think what Ross says before was was right. Sometimes you need the team to do the business on the pitch. Yeah. I know Klopp came out before the game. Oh, was yeah. like we needed to come out and do that. But I think it was a perfect storm of I think the ref wing wasn't giving us decisions, and then we just started turning the screw. And when Liverpool gets into the rhythm of winning the ball back, Fabinho does yeah. it so well. And we're, we're like Bobby's running back to get the ball back. Man, he's running back, getting the ball back, keeping this consistent like pressure going. And then like you say, every time the ball goes out for the corner. Oof, yeah. Everyone jumps oh, yeah. up. The, the, and the play build, the play see. helps to build up the pressure, undoubtedly. But it, just in terms of a mentality, I think once they go 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 a goal ahead, it's like hang on a second. You think you're taking our points? Well, fuck you. There are points. Let's have our points. Whereas the mentality going into the game was there are points. Don't worry. There are there are points. Whereas it should be. You think you're going to come into our ground and take our points? That's what like the fuck they do. When they, like go to Belgrade. That's mm. what they fucking do. Yeah. You don't come into our house and fucking and try and have our did, fucking try and have our points off us. Did that that's what they do it in, in Germany. You know what I mean? There's still a 
yeah, um, whatever reason, maybe it's just being off the boil and not having enough footy because a lot of us were walking back into Anfield for yeah. for the first time in like what it's like a month or whatever since but we fucking every game at Anfield should more or less be a fucking party. Fucking twenty two mm-hmm. points clear, like yeah. fucking celebrate the team that you've got. Yeah. And, and and I get it's a you know what's happened before, isn't it? Going one up and then one one like. Yeah. I, is it, well, it's, all, it's, it's West Ham on a Monday night. I can't get up for that. Being upbeat is hard. Being upbeat is hard. Being angry is dead easy. We're all angry. <laughs> We're all fucking dead pissed off. Just come into the fucking game pissed off. Did and, instead, and, and, and just fucking sh- and shout, at, shout at the fucking cunts who are in, are in the way, you know? Did it happen when, when they scored the goals, like the crowd got up? Did that happen like it has every game at Anfield? Yeah. Or was it... Because that, that, I think that that's a massive part of how our mentality's changed. Yeah. And we're speaking about raising our level. That didn't happen. That didn't happen a year and a half ago. It just yeah. didn't. Yeah. Is everyone just going, uh, it's fine, we've conceded. Yeah. Bang, let's get up. And, and you saw Virgil van Dijk as soon as he heard it. He went, get that ball back, we're going yeah. again. And uh, I think you are right in what you're saying. We are getting there. Well, I'm saying it. What we're doing. That might be the moment that, that makes it a thing. Because you know, mm. that's the thing. We, we talk about it like... There's not so long. I was I was talking to the guy next to me. Have you got onto the fact that they now at every game now they say um, about standing in the cop. They don't make you sit down anymore, mm. and that's been a building thing. It used to be European nights they turn a blind eye the and games. the big games, but every other every other game you do you it actively. And then this season they've been saying I've been talking for every game this season in the cop every single game, and they've got a voice over the tannoy that used to say. Like sit down for in the interest of the people with small children or people who can't stand be this and they, and they made it a bit like any like anyone who's caught persistent standing will be ejected from the stadium and now they just go can we just ask you to please be aware of issues surrounding persistent standing thank you and then everyone sings and reinforces why we stood up I love it but again that's like a as I say things happening at times like I said this might be I'm saying this all now. We might that this might we might just start doing that from you know or more and more from games on and now on and if we can do that, fuck me, mm. fuck me, you know what I mean? What what an unbelievable thing what we'll have there. Um, anyway, look twenty two about oh yeah, Allison brilliant at the end denied Jared Bow. It's almost gets over o- o- overlooked. Um, we've got the best goalkeeper in the world. He's glorious. Um, Doesn't that sum him up though? When we said this loads of times before, like I don't think he makes a mistake for the for their first goal, but he gets distracted, doesn't he? And obviously, you know, concede the second. But <laughs> we sat to goalkeepers two, three years ago, and then they wouldn't have made that save because their heads would have gone. Yeah, he's he... so far out of where you're supposed to be comfortable as a goalkeeper, I'd imagine. Yeah, as well, like you know <laughs> what I mean. And I, and I believe Martin Tyler said, "Well, he gets a bit lucky. And he hits his head. That's why you stay big. Yeah. That's the whole point of being a fucking goalkeeper. You've just got to take it on whatever body part you can get there. That's you know." I played footy on a Wednesday night last week. I have got bruises all over my thighs and the lads were fuming on me because I wasn't moving out the way. Yeah. Whereas most of the people you play five a side with actively dive like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you go in those no situations, one-on-one situations like that. <laughs> well, the, Ross, Ross. As a centre God, forward, yeah. as a centre forward, you've got two choices. You dink, you're pretty much dinking it over the keeper or you go around the goalkeeper. And Alison's saying, try and go around me, mate. Well, because we saw what happened the other week. Absolutely, and so, but I think so much of forwards is just it's instinctive. You're not really reacting to the situation. You're just going through the going through the motions. That's why a lot of people just always go around the goalkeeper. Like the original Ronaldo, just go around the keeper every time because that was his way of doing things. Someone like that Bowen lad has come from nowhere. Effectively, he's not he's not an elite level footballer at the levels he's played at. Goalkeepers probably do just dive at the feet. And that's why you get like you, you are, so you're either gonna get a penalty or you're gonna dink it over or you're gonna dink it over the keeper and Allison just comes out this big giant bear and he just fucking hits it at him. Good, yeah, it's just good goalkeeper. Allison had one before where a ball kind of comes over the top and I think he he hesitates to go, and he might have been offside anyway. But he hesitates to go, and on the on the commentary, they were like, "Why isn't he just not 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 get that?" And I was like, "Because look how big he is. No matter what that player does, he's blocking it regardless. So he doesn't need to fucking dive at him and punch him in the head like Edison would. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just go big, stop it, and and it goes out for the corner in the end or something. I think. Yeah, but absolutely. Brilliant. Um, Twenty-two points clear again. Slept well last night. Yeah, just mad. Because uh, uh, I, I genuinely, this is the first game, Chris, where. When I had the little conversation made when we're two one down, and I was like, "Well, this might be the end of the Invincibles run. This might be that, and th- that would be a shame." But look, ultimately, it's it's always going to be about winning winning the title, and it was the first time I like I, I said when I say I wasn't asked, nineteen points is a, is a ridiculous is a ridiculous lead to have. Um, 
22 points is, I mean, again, we're, we're, it's only what we're back to. We're not, we're not the league tonight at the moment, not getting any bigger. And also, we're not getting any smaller. The difference between 19 points and 22 points is a bit moot, but to be in the 20s, <laughs> it's, it's, just, just, it's just crazy. And once again, like, you know, we've won 18 games on the bounce and yeah, Sky Sports, and I know you retweeted it last week and all that type of stuff. It's all like the records that are upcoming as well, isn't it? But that's 18 Premier Leagues. We've got the record with City now. We're coming up on the away records. Yeah. We're coming up on the home records. We've and equaled the wins that the Invincibles got in their league. league. Well, that's oh, yeah, the, that's yeah. the yeah. most wins. Oh, sorry, the Invincibles yeah. one. But the, the one that I find most fascinating is it was only Manchester United when we were a game behind getting that record. So we'd done 17 wins on the bounce and then drew with United. Yeah. And that was it, over. And it's fucking 18 games later and we've equaled it. Yeah. We've had two attempts at the hardest record to get in league football history in one fucking year. And we're, <laughs> we've done it like, you know what I mean? It's just ridiculous. Yeah, no, it is. I, was, I must admit, I was thinking, I was like, how many games are there left in the season? If we don't do it now, have we, is there enough left for us to have, another, to have another spin on it before the season ended? But no, it is. You're right, it's more points than Man United's treble winning team amassed the season the day that they more did it. The same? More he, points he, that, or at least that, yeah. equal yeah. that. Is, regardless, we're going to have more than that than that team had. Same, similar with the Invincibles side. And most importantly, 11 more draws and we've won it. <laughs> also, I think we play twice. Can't do that. We play twice <laughs> before yeah. City play again. Yeah, so you can see we'd be 28 points clear by the time. <laughs> fucking by the time. Imagine Man City rocking up and being like, what's the point? I think what is the point? Because Leicester, yeah. Leicester look like they're pretty much done. Like, it's City, it's City's going to be showed up in second place pretty the, sharp. The, the sure, thing is, like, we're comparing ourselves to some of the best Premier League either teams ever, but you've got to, the best part for me is there was a eulogy, someone was eulogising on the, on the commentary I was listening to about how we're comparable to this the, the team in like the 70s and what have you. This team of legends, like these players that I just get told about and they're just yeah. like, this player was the best. And I was like, well, I've never seen them. And now this team is better and it's breaking more records and it's never going to get forgotten. And I'm going to be able to sit there and go, when I'm talking to people, be like, where were you at this game? And I'll remember, I remember exactly what, I went to that one. Oh, did you go to that one? That's boss, that year. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, I was actively there. I was in the crowd for that one. There's so many memories that have been made throughout this. And we're going to literally be able to sit there for the rest of my life. I'm going to be able to sit there and go, yeah, I watched Liverpool just win the league. I'm it looking cancel, forward. It doesn't even matter. I'm looking easy. forward to in 30 years time being my dad. Yeah. And my lad being me, I'm going like, and what was that like, Dad? Like, oh, son, we just, you know, they, they just go a goal up and we just shout at them and go and win. It was great. Yeah. After last night's game, my dad always told me the worst thing you do against the Liverpool side in the 70s was score against them. Yeah. Like, last night, I was like, oh, can we just put it on the 70s side? Like, oh, can can we just how amazing that last night Monday Night Football actually chose to talk about football outside of the Premier League era by ranking uh, Bob Paisley and his Liverpool side as the best, as the best team of all it's time. Good segment. Yeah, it was it's really good. Do you know what? Monday Night Footy is the best fucking thing on television. Yeah. Consistently, like the levels that those get, those that team of people get up to is is unbelievable. And and you know, to rank Bob Paisley's side up there above all else is just brilliant. And it's something that Liverpool fans have probably known for a long time. But they talk about it. And it was my, I was I was watching it back this morning, and they were saying like they, they won the first team to win the European Cup and the league in the same season. They won the the, the European Cup back to back. First English team to do it back to back in that in and that. They got the in, UEFA Cup and they got the UEFA Cup, Cup in that spell as well. And I was just thinking that like. I know that this side doesn't have that silverware, but how close this side is, and you could, we could get two have, European cups, two league titles. Because they they they're talking about like a three year period, and in a three year period, uh, this if you count this season, we'll have to see how this season ends. This could this three year period could have been two European cups and a league title. It could still be two European cups and and, and a league title league and titles. one more final. Yeah, sorry, yeah, and and, and it could have been two league titles. So. Fractionally close to to being that in that era, Klopp, you know, three European finals in that time, another another cup final thrown into there, two league title challenges, potentially one that, that one that wins it. In You're four right, games, on, on in four games, if we win next four games in the Premier League, we are undoubtedly the best club side in the world. Yeah. We were the world champions, European champions, and the English league champions. They are three massive, massive accolades yeah. that not like that to hold all three of them for the end of the season. Yeah. And, and uh, we're talking, we're saying there's going to be a party atmosphere. 
Liverpool is gonna like I'm already happy regardless of what ha- like yeah. football just makes me happy at the moment. There's nothing better than like thinking about it. All I need to do is think about it and I'm beam and smile. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And it for us to just be able to sit there and bask in it, we're gonna have however many games of the season and yeah, like it maybe the atmosphere is not gonna be massive because we'll be like, Oh, we've already won it but you best believe everyone's going in the booze straight after. Everyone's in the booze are watching the game just with smiles on the face yeah. and, and the the effect that this team has had on not just this city because there's there's supporters around the world, but just think about everyone whose day is made every like you can just go into work and just stroll in or any time you're having a hardship, you're like, I'll just watch the Reds here. And and it, it it's like it's it's like therapy every time you watch it. I think it might even be better for people outside the city because they like some of them get up at like fucking three to watch the game. We just don't lose anymore. At least it's worthwhile for <laughs> yeah, them now. You're like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Pissed at nine o'clock in the morning, <laughs> like you've had you've seen us you've seen us win. No, I I do. It, it, that's it's so, it. it because that's the one thing, it, it adds to so much of the negativity that surrounds the club on social media and all that, because you can't, you, you, there's no accounting for having your day ruined before your day's even begun, or, you know, I, I, right at the end, it's staying up till all hours to watch them, we don't really can take that into consideration. We're down anyway, but if you added an extra five hours to the day uh, uh, in doing that, then yeah. But yeah, when Liverpool are great, everyone's great, and it's magnificent. Um, right, before we wrap up, uh, Chris did a special feature with Paul from Kit It Out, which is a fantastic campaign that looks to get people uh, donating old football shirts to, to give to disadvantaged kids and what have you. Um, take a little look and listen to this. Uh, other than that, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you all soon. Ta-da. For anybody who's watching now who doesn't know, you take in football kits yeah. and give them to people who are disadvantaged and don't have football kits, yeah. that's important. So we get footy kits donated to us, to the page, just from members of the public, just everyday people who have got kits left over and then we get them out to community centres in Liverpool, all around Liverpool, in all different places and then they get them out to kids who haven't got football kits. And you've got quite a bit of media coverage recently. I saw you on the news the other week. Yeah, we a lot of people have been getting involved and because they obviously see it as there's a there's a gap. There's kids who haven't got football kits and the idea is just resonates with everyone, really. I mean, we go to community centres and there's kids there who have only got one kit between four of them in a family. So they wear the kit every single day, each person. So when you get a new kit, and you know what it's like, when you get a new football kit, it's like you'll never have the kit off. So yeah. it just gives them confidence as well to play with the mates and you can play anywhere they want now with a football kit. That's br- I mean, it's, it's absolutely brilliant, isn't it? And, you know, since you've started, when did you actually start the project? Uh, we started it in October 2019, so oh, five months ago, not long. And as I say, we had two weeks off work and I just started a Facebook, started a Twitter and just started bombarding people with messages about what we're doing and people just reacted to it and here we are. Now. As you say, it, it does really resonate with people, doesn't it? And especially like, you know, I'm thinking of myself right now and, you know, I've got two girls, but I've got them footy kits, yeah. they've got the Liverpool kits and stuff and to be honest with you, Paul, they've probably grown out of them yeah, yeah. and they're still just sat there in my cupboard, so I'm going to make sure that I get you those yeah. kits because I know I've got the full kit. Do you accept more than just the full kits? We Do you accept take shirts, and shirts, shorts, socks. I mean, we've been to places and kids are playing in the uniforms and they can't get on the pitch because health and safety says you can't play in a uniform or your school shoes. And even if they do get on the pitch, they're just wrecking their uniforms and that. And then it's a cycle because then they need a uniform and yeah. they can't afford that. It's just things like that. Everyone could do with a kit and there's people out there who are so underprivileged now. How many kids have you got that are extra large men's size? <laughs> because I've got fucking tons of them. <laughs> there's so many. So we, we go to community centres, but also we there's a lot of work that Michelle does with uh, Asylum Link as well, with refugees who come over here and they want to play football, but... You know what I mean? They've got nothing at all, but we get them kits, adult kits go to them and they're just, they're made up. So if I brought them in as well and got, and got them to Every you, Every yeah. kit could go somewhere and it would make a person today, you know what I mean? To see someone giving them a kit, it says to them, you know what I mean? Welcome, go and play football and go and enjoy yourself. And so, uh, like, where can we where can we send these kits to if anybody wants to? Uh, you can get in touch with the Twitter page or the Facebook page and we'll direct you to the drop-off points and even come and knock at our house and we'll open the door and make you a cup of tea and sh- you know what I mean? show you the kids we've already got. And, and who has been sort of the, 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 the 
the biggest supporter, if you were, because you know I see you know AS Roma yeah. is one of the things that I've seen while I've been yeah. following you and stuff like that. Is there any other clubs that have got involved? Yeah, well, AS Roma, obviously amazing. Uh, Paul Rogers, who does the social media, he's absolutely. He used to work at Liverpool, actually. Didn't he's, he, Paul, yeah, he's yeah. absolutely unbelievable for him to just jump on board and do that. He didn't have to, but obviously their social media is ahead of the game, Roma. Uh, we've got Jason Pettigrew from Barcelona. Mm -hmm. He's the he, he's the editor. He's going to bring kits over for the Legends games for us to give out. But not just that, it's working class solidarity. And as the fellas from Fan Support and Food Bank say, it's just one big circle. Everyone helps each other. We've had kits from members of the public all over Liverpool, but schools like St Paul's Junior School do a collection for us and get us kits out. Uh, just people like Omen Property in Liverpool City Centre, they've bought us new kits. There's just a massive thing. Um, the Runcorn Linnets Football Club mm -hmm. dropped like two boxes off for us yesterday, just full of kits. Everyone's just getting involved. It's just, as I say, working class solidarity all coming together.